Hello, and welcome to One to Grow on a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey. I'm slightly sick, and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad, and I'm just fine. Each episode, we pick an area of agriculture or food production that confuses a lot of people and try to get Hallie to explain it to us. And this week, we are doing our fourth and final part on our organic series. Yes, so this is the end of the line in terms of research. This is this is going to be kind of the wrap up. We have a couple of additional topics to cover. We're going to talk about economic issues. We're going to talk about consumer health, and then we'll kind of just we'll kind of just chat about our thoughts and feelings. I think. And that's it for organic food. There's nothing else to talk about. I mean, there's always more to talk about. There's always more to talk about. We tried to be as extensive as we could with this four part series, but there is really there is miles and miles of of different ideas and different perspectives with organic agriculture that we could probably do a hundred episodes and we would still not cover everyone's thoughts and feelings and all the facts around it. All right. Well, you said we were starting with economic issues. Yes, I would like to do that. Fire away. So when we're thinking about international trade, kind of the the economic law of it is that international trade is good for economies, right? There are different reasons for that. But when we're talking about agriculture specifically, it's good because we can't grow everything here in the U.S., right? We're really bad at growing bananas and we eat a lot of bananas. So having international trade with agriculture allows for greater diversity in grocery stores. Bananas are delicious. They're, they're pretty good. <laughs> they're pretty good. But when we're thinking about organic, you have kind of an added layer of bureaucracy, right? So international trade regulation, there's already a lot of bureaucracy. But when you think about adding organic onto that, like if someone wanted to import something here into the U.S., they have to make sure either they're certified by the USDA or that their country's certification is approved by the USDA to be comparable to a USDA certification. So right now there's a couple of countries and certifications that if you have that certification, you can say it's also USDA organic certified because they're at like the same level. They have the same standards, but that's, it's a very complicated process. And I didn't research other countries and kind of how their comparability works, but I assume, honestly, if you're dealing with quite that many bureaucracies, you know, it's, it's going to get convoluted and it's going to get complicated. So that can kind of hinder international trade. It can make it difficult. Although typically when farmers are importing organic food, they're getting an additional price premium. So it might be worth it. Bureaucracy does tend to complicate things in a way that other things just can't. It's very true. Yep. Do we know which countries have these agreements with the U.S.? Yeah, so right now we import organic food from Canada, Mexico, India, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland, South Korea, and the European Union. We export to Canada, Taiwan, Japan, Switzerland, South Korea, and the European Union. So there's a lot of countries out there, and we have a really limited number that we interact with in terms of organic, right? We import from a lot more countries than that when we think about food, but organics kind of limits where we can import from. Got it. And we mentioned in the Farms and Farmers episode, you know, an individual farmer can get USDA certified if they're not here in the U.S. So we can import from other countries, but these are the only countries that we have this, you know, broad equivalency with where, you know, any organic farmer can import into the U.S. easily. If you're living outside of one of these, you know, couple countries, then it becomes a lot more difficult for you to get organic certified because you have to deal with the U.S. and you're not in the U.S. and it kind of gets complicated. So that said, the U.N. has stated that they think that increasing organic agriculture broadly can help developing countries because a lot of farmers in smaller economies aren't using chemical inputs and so they're already growing organically. And so they won't have transition costs. All they have to do basically would be to get certified. Oh, well, that's convenient. And based on what we talked about in a previous episode, maybe they could even make more money doing it. Yeah, but again, it can be quite difficult to get USDA certified. Like if you're not in one of those countries that I listed earlier, there's like about 30 USDA certifiers for the whole world that isn't the U.S., 
right? There's tons in the U.S. Outside the U.S., there's about 30 that operate, which is not a lot for the whole world other than our country. I'm going to say there's more than 30 countries in the world outside of the U.S. and By a lot. <laughs> Listener, fun fact. Hallie likes to play a fun game where she lists all of the countries in the world. I do like that game a lot. I do like it a lot. I'm pretty good. You are pretty good. One time your dad tried to tell me that Kyrgyzstan wasn't a country, but I guess it was, probably wasn't a country when he was learning the countries. Maybe not. Map has changed a few times since his day. So a third of all organic agricultural land and more than three-fourths of all the organic producers are located in developing and transitional economies. So this really has the opportunity to provide price premiums to these farmers in developing nations, in transitioning nations. Uh, however, like there are also a lot more farmers, right, in developing countries and in transitional countries. So any place in the agricultural system that you can have price premiums is probably going to impact farmers in developing countries because there's just a lot of farmers in, a, in most developing countries. Right. And I'm trying to put together some stuff you said earlier, which was yeah. that the organic certification process is, you know, difficult and pricey. And we're mm -hmm. talking about farmers in developing countries, I'm presuming that they have, you know, less money to put into such a process. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And so there have been some discussions around that, you know, is this something that might widen a wealth gap between smaller and larger farmers in developing nations? You know, are, is there an opportunity for small scale farmers to go together on like a co-op and all have the exact same management practices and all be certified together and be able to share those costs? It's unclear how these regulations are going to impact developing farmers across the board. Right. We've seen a lot of different case studies. But as far as I know, there's not currently any data saying definitively like this is a trend we're seeing. It is being good or it is being bad for small scale farmers in developing countries. Right. So I said earlier that three fourths or more of all the organic producers are located in those developing and transitional economies. However, 96% of all of the certified organic purchases are made in Europe and North America. So that's kind of another thing when we talk about barriers to getting this price premium. You have to, you know, get your food to this market that's pretty far away. If you're in South America or if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa or, you know, Southeast Asia, something like that. You know, if you if that's where you live, that's pretty far to get it to market. Yeah, it seems like they could still sell it locally for the same price. But then I guess you lose your money on the organic certification. And, oh, I don't know. Yeah, getting it to market's another challenge. Yeah, I mean, they're just you usually don't see those same price premiums outside of North America or Europe. Like organic food, it, there's not as much of a demand for it. And so you can't get the same price premiums. You can't get more money for selling tomatoes with a sticker on it versus not with a sticker on it. And that's not true everywhere. Like there are cities, you know, in every country where you can find organic produce. But generally, the, the most demand for it is going to be in North America and in Europe. Do these farms normally export a lot? No. So small-scale okay. farmers are probably not going to be exporting as much. They're going to be utilizing local markets just because you have costs associated with getting produce to market, right? You know, even if it's just getting it to your local market, you've got to drive it there in your truck or on a wagon. Or, you know, if you're taking it to be exported, you have to find a buyer who's willing to export it. And so there are all these different barriers to entry that small-scale farmers have that might exclude them from larger marketplaces. You also have, you know, economies of scale. So oftentimes if you're a purchaser, you might be looking for a larger farm just because it's easier for you to deal with one farm to get, you know, a bunch of tomatoes versus having to deal with 10 small farms to get a bunch of tomatoes. Yeah. And also, I guess, as we learned in the episode about environmental issues related to organic food and in, in part two, shipping all that food a long way sort of negates some of the uh, environmental benefits, at least in reducing the carbon footprint. Yeah, it definitely can. So another thing when we're talking about economics uh, that we want to think about is kind of access, right? Is this organic food just like a rich people thing? So you've said a couple of times in the series, organic food is more expensive, and sometimes that's the case. But there was this consumer report study that found that it is on average 47% more expensive 
to shop organic, which is a lot more expensive. Yeah, that's a that's a big percentage. However, they did find that the price varied a lot depending on the product. So some of the products were cheaper and some of them were like 300% more. So the cost associated with shopping organic is not equally felt across prepared products versus produce versus frozen items. Wow. I wonder what the thing was that was 300% more than its conventionally grown counterpart. I know. I kind of want to know. Although I imagine it's probably something like an ice cream or something. Oh, uh, uh, an organic certified prepared food of some sort. Yeah, something that's like kind of gourmet, marketed as like really fancy. I imagine it's something like that. All right. So you also often have organic, I mean, organic food is often less available, right? I live in a place where it's hard for me to find organic food. All these berries are in season right now, but I don't like to buy non-organic berries for a couple of different reasons. And so I haven't been buying that many berries because I live in an area with limited food access. And it's not necessarily limited food access across the board, but there are fewer options here, right? Like I can get healthy food. For a reasonable price, I can go and I can buy canned beans or dry beans or, you know, I can get rice, I can get cereal. But some of these options, some of these choices are not available to me here. And we definitely see that in rural food deserts, in urban centers that are, you know, mostly a food desert. We'll see fewer available organic certified products. And it's not like where you live is even a tiny town. I mean, it's it's small, but there's still, what, tens of thousands of people there. So it's like, I'm kind of wonder what the market threshold is for, you know, selling a lot of this stuff. It caters to wealthier markets, I'm presuming. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I live in an area that is low income, right? And so if organic food is more expensive, there's not going to be a huge market for it because you're looking at consumers who don't have a lot of disposable income, who aren't able to spend more on their prepared foods or on their produce. So that is definitely a consideration. So the other thing when we're talking about economic considerations is kind of the industry side of this. What are some of the trade-offs, some of the benefits of this in terms of the larger agricultural industry? So one of them is non-organic pesticide companies employ thousands and thousands of people. They drive a lot of research. They do a lot of really impressive science and work. And so organic agriculture is kind of cutting those jobs out. There are arguments to be made on that, but there are people out here doing science that are being paid by these non-organic pesticide companies or fertilizer companies or whatever. So that's a consideration. That's not something I would have thought about, just jobs created adjacent to the practice itself. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of one of the arguments. Against, well, it's not an argument against it, but it's something that people in the industry often will bristle at because organic agriculture kind of sidesteps all of these large agricorps that are doing all this R&D for new seed and new pesticides and new fertilizers. So there's all these, you know, thousands and thousands of researchers and, you know, grain elevator operators who are, you know, trying to research seed and, you know, breed these different products and create all these different inputs that if you're not buying inputs or buying GMO seed, you're you're cutting out all of those kind of high paying jobs in the agri-industry. So then we have farmers, right? So how how does organic agriculture impact a farmer? So we have talked about the high cost of getting certified. The fee ranges can be from the hundreds to the thousands every year, depending on the scale of the farm, which is a lot, right? I think that the the barrier for when you have to start getting certified is like $5,000. If you're making $5,000 off your farm, you have to start paying if you want to call it organic. That's a lot of money, you know, even if it's the hundreds or even if it's the thousands, that's going to be a lot to be putting towards this certification. It just occurred to me that I really have no idea what the scale of revenue on a farm would even be. I mean, farmers are dealing with tight margins. And so certification fees can be a really significant consideration. That makes sense. Yeah. Some states will have assistance programs to kind of offset those costs, but those are kind of few and far between. And then besides the direct cost, there's also a lot of paperwork. And farmers are small business owners, so their time is money. There's not a lot of data on this, on like how farmers feel about the paperwork associated with organic. I have an anecdote about that where I met a farmer who said that he had been organic certified and he found himself spending like two hours a day on paperwork 
And he was he was really, really close with his consumer base. And so he kind of talked with them and was like, does this certification really mean that much to y'all? And they're like, you know, we know you. We know how you grow. So whether or not you have this doesn't really matter to us. And so he ended up dropping the organic certification, but continuing to farm the exact same way. So it still could be called organic, except for that he hasn't paid this money and he isn't doing these hours and hours of paperwork. So I don't know. I've heard I've heard a lot of farmers talk about the paperwork side of things. I've heard estimates of two hours a day. I've heard people say four hours a day. Honestly, those seem quite high. There's not a lot of data on this. I don't really know. I don't know how much it is, but from the farmers I've spoken with, this is a really significant consideration. As a guy that wants to spend zero hours of his day doing paperwork, any amount sounds like a lot, quite frankly. And Uh, I can see why that's a serious consideration for them. Yeah, for sure. And often, like, you will see organic prices dropping. So the cost benefit with getting that certification is really kind of reworking itself in a lot of farmers' minds. If your margins are thin already and you're getting a lower price for an organic premium, is it really worth it to be spending all of this time and spending this extra money to get certified? There's a lot of questions there. And there's also a lot of questions on what the USDA is doing with those funds. You have all these certification fees. There's a lot of questions that people have, which I think makes sense. You know, if you're looking at a farmer, they're probably within a certain demographic um, ideologically, which is, you know, often quite focused on independence and, you know, really considering what the government is doing with these funds that we're handing over. So, yeah, there's a lot of questions around the certification fees and kind of the extensiveness that they require. So you also have transition time. So it takes like three years to transition from a non-organic system to an organic system. So within those three years, you're going to have a lot of costs and you're not going to be seeing those price premiums because you won't be able to call it organic until after the transition time. That sounds like a really difficult transition. Yeah. Should we do a transition ourselves? Yeah, I think our transition is going to be a lot easier. (laughs) What a very smooth transition. Right into the break. So right into easy. the break. <laughs> right in. So smooth. Like a slug. Thank you, listener, for transitioning with us. And thank you to our Starfruit patron, Lindsay. Thank you, you wonderful and beautiful queen among men. Thank you for all of your support. Uh, yeah, you rock. You're amazing. You are fantastic. If you would like to join her, you could go to patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. And for as little as $1 a month, you can help support us and help us bring content that really helps to educate people about their food and and where it comes from and everything that happens to it, from the planting to the selling part. Yes, our current Patreon goal is to reach 50 patrons. And once we reach that goal, we're going to release three super fun mini-sodes that we actually just started working on. And we're really trying to play with format. They're going to be super fun, super enlightening, super interesting. Super fun is the main goal with it. Uh, so if you're interested in having those mini sods released into the world, $1 will get us that much closer. Fun guaranteed. Should we get back to the episode? Back to the episode. Okay, Dad, do you have a nature fact for us? I do. <gasps> okay. What so it? this is the fourth part in our four-part yes. series on organics. Yes. It's a saga. So CH4 is the methane carbon molecule with four hydrogens also called methane yeah uh, um also known as fart gas y- sure yeah sure so four is the number of <laughs> horsemen of the apocalypse and the uh-huh. four horsemen of the apocalypse were characters on good omens which i just finished <laughs> watching not too long ago and i quite enjoyed it why did you pull methane into this well because it's the fourth episode, and methane uh-huh. is CH4, and there's I know, but it just sounds horsemen. like you wanted to talk about good omens. It doesn't sound like methane has anything to do with your nature effect. I mean, it has four hydrogen atoms, and there's four horsemen <laughs> of the apocalypse, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse are in good omens, although two of them are represented by women, and they ride motorcycles, so I don't know. Yeah. So it's good? Uh, it's pretty good. It's really... I remember You gave me Good Omens when I was like 14 to read. Yeah, the, the book is a lot of fun for sure. Yeah. The show, the relationship between the two main characters is a lot of fun to watch develop. And that's what it's mostly about, of course. 
some of the peripheral stuff is also good, but a lot of it's quite dull because of the way it's done. But mm. overall, I I quite enjoyed it. Is there a theme song with Good Omens? Yes. How does it go? I don't remember. I mean, oh, it's part on. of the show intro, you know. Well, I was going to do the Nature Fact theme to the theme song, but I don't know the theme song. Well, then I think you should just do the regular Nature Fact theme song. Okay. Da -da 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 -da. Nature Fact. Nature Fact. Okay, Dad, I think we are about to get into the section that everyone has been wondering about since the beginning, because this is always what I get questions about. Are you ready? So ready. I've been ready for this okay. for four and a half. In fact, I think I asked you about this yes. in episode two, and you're like, we're not there yet. Yes. Okay. So, consumer health, how this impacts you and me. What do you know about this? What are your thoughts as someone who hasn't been researching this for a while? My thoughts are that organic food nutritionally has the same value as conventionally grown food, so far as I know. Okay. The pesticides used in conventionally grown food are more harmful, so far as I know. Mm-hmm. But to consumers, uh, to everything. Okay. And so far as I know, they're easy for consumers to wash off, although I'm not positive about that. As far as health impacts to consumers go, that's everything I can think of that I've ever really thought about. OK, so I will start out this section and I will continue to repeat this throughout this section. There is not a lot of money in researching organic agriculture. Right. There is no big corporation that's looking to give R&D grants to professors. So basically everyone's competing for the same NSF funding. Sometimes there's other sources of funding, but there's just there's not a lot of streams of money for organic agricultural research. So we don't know a lot about this, unfortunately, even though it's been something that has been on our markets for more than 20 years. This is not something we know a lot about. Unfortunately. Yeah, I guess it's just a lot of people going, oh, that sounds like, it sounds like that way is better. So there is some science. We need more. We definitely need more science, but there is currently some. So yes, there is pesticide residue on produce. Organic produce does not have residue that is things like neurotoxins. However, the amount of pesticide residue on your food is quite small. Current science suggests that it's unlikely to cause harm. There might be some risk to pregnant people or people who are nursing, but there is, you know, kind of, there's more research that's needed. We don't know a ton about this. Does it wash off? I, probably, but there is, there is mixed reports. There are, there's mixed evidence, and it's also dependent often on the type of pesticides. So some pesticides are mixed in water. Some pesticides are mixed in oil. There, there's a lot of factors, unfortunately. And I suspect if you typed, does pesticide wash off into Google, you would end up with a lot of propaganda from both sides of the organic food debate. Yes, probably so. So a lot of the information that's available, like on public websites that aren't like .gov or .edu, are like industry websites. So usually it's like Bayer or, you know, some kind of large agri corporation that is running a website talking about how everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And you can also find like organics websites where it's organic advocacy organizations that are saying like, no, nothing is fine. Avoid anything that's not certified. So we need more science, basically. Glyphosate, which is Roundup, which is an herbicide that's not approved for organic, so it's only in conventional production. There is some evidence that it's a carcinogen. There's evidence that there are residues on produce. There is not a lot of evidence that those residues can cause cancer in consumers, but it's not really researched that much. We need more evidence. We need more research. More research needed. Glyphosate's been in the news recently because in the California courts, Monsanto was found liable for some cancer that some landscapers got that was connected to their use of glyphosate. However, there is more research needed on even if it causes cancer in farm workers and landscapers and other people who were directly using this product. So we really, unfortunately, don't know a ton. But currently, it's, it's in the news because of that. Nutritionally, there is evidence that organic food 
has more nutrients, but it's quite marginal. It's like quite small. However, there is also more and more evidence that growing food in a rich soil, in a really, really healthy, high quality soil, is going to lead to more nutrient dense produce. However, organic agriculture does not necessarily mean that you have a really healthy soil. It just means that you're farming to organic standards. So there is some evidence that the way that you farm can impact the nutrition of the produce there, which kind of makes sense. You know, we'll have different nutrients available based on how the soil is managed. So there is that, but there's not any evidence really that directly ties increased nutrition of any significant amount to specifically certified organic production. In cereal crops, so things like rice, wheat, corn, there has been a link to organic agriculture having lower levels of cadmium, which is a heavy metal. There is evidence that it's quite a small risk to no risk, but cadmium does accumulate in your body. So pesticides have this heavy metal in them, and so this is something that doesn't necessarily wash off when you're rinsing it in your sink. So, again, more research is needed to, to really show whether or not there is significant amounts of cadmium being deposited in consumers. I wouldn't worry about it too much, though. Thank you for saying that, because I had no idea there was any risk of cadmium in my produce, but... There is no to small risk currently evidenced. Okay. <laughs> but we need more research. Um, we also have super bugs, which is something that is somewhat tied to organic agriculture, right? If you're farming organic meat or dairy, you're not using preventative antibiotics, and so you're not necessarily contributing to antibiotic resistance in the same way that you would if you were using preventative antibiotics. Superbugs are bad. I don't know a ton of information. I am not an epidemiologist, but this is something that people often bring up, especially when they're talking about meat and dairy in organics. Have you seen any post-apocalyptic movie where the mass extinction was caused by some sort of disease. True. True, true, true. That's all the evidence you need right there is movies. <laughs> okay, so to wrap up this section, there is not enough strong evidence to confirm that organic food is significantly more beneficial to human health than conventional foods. But we need more research. We need more research. There is not a lot of research about this. We need more research. More research needed. So after four episodes, yes, if we could conclude all of it in, in aggregate, organic food versus conventionally grown food. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just said that there's no evidence that it's significantly better for human health. Human consumer health. That it's significantly better for human consumer health, right. But what about, you know, all of everything put together? So this is, I guess, the part of the podcast where we get into conjecture and opinions, right? Oh, no. My Let's just stop right mm -hmm. here. We're done. That's okay. it. Show over. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Here's my perspective. Okay. As someone who works in the industry, as someone who eats food, I will usually buy organic foods if it's things like berries, tomatoes, a lot of those fresh fruits. I will buy those certified organic. Because? Because, and this can also include canned vegetables or frozen fruits, anything that is those lovely, delicious, fresh produce, those are very pesticide intense when you're farming them conventionally, right? And a lot of the pesticides that are used are neurotoxins, and that's just the truth of it. And there are really, really poor worker protections for farm workers. And there are a lot of trade-offs that we discussed here on the podcast. and above and beyond what we talked about when looking from a farm worker perspective at organic versus conventional production. There are a lot of trade-offs. But one thing that I think about is that if I buy conventional blueberries, someone probably sprayed neurotoxins on them with their human hands. And I have just read too much evidence about the poor worker protections and the poor levels of personal protective equipment that's used here in the U.S. and internationally, that that's kind of my choice. Beyond that, I 
try to get to know my farmer. And that's the truth of it. Like if I am buying from a company, I try and research the company. If I'm going to be buying their products frequently, uh, if I'm buying produce and it's at all possible, I try and buy it from local farmers that I know how they grow, where they grow, how they treat their farm workers, because that's something that's important to me. I know I'm speaking with a lot of privilege here, and I know that it's more expensive, but as someone who lives with the ability to spend more money in certain areas of my life, my food is one place where I always choose to spend more money. I, I, I cut back on other things, but food is something that I will spend more money on if I know more about how it was farmed and where it came from and who is growing it or producing it or, you know, processing it. If I know more about that and I know that they're treating their workers right and that they're improving their ecosystem, that is something that I really value and will contribute to. That does not necessarily mean that I will always buy organic or that even when I am buying produce regularly from small-scale farmers, that I'm buying it from farmers who are organic because there's a lot of trade-offs. And we have talked on this series a lot about how you can farm ecologically, you can farm in a way that's safe for your farm workers without being certified organic. That's kind of my takeaway. Words of wisdom from Howie Casey. What are, what are your thoughts? How are you going to kind of walk away from this four-part series? That's a good question. And just to backtrack half sec, the reason that things like tomatoes and berries are pesticide intensive is because pests yeah. really like those foods. Yeah. So things like onions and garlic just have much lower pest incidence because they're not as delicious. Right. Basically, they're not as yummy to eat raw versus something like a raspberry. So pretty much my whole life, I've bought whatever the cheapest option is. Mm -hmm. That's just been my MO. And I've never been that excited by farmers markets. I've gone to a few and there was one here in Austin that I really liked for a while, but it's no longer around. And the one that I know of now is just not my kind of farmer's market. It, it doesn't seem like farmers. It's people selling products and stuff. Yeah. So maybe next time I go to the grocery store, I will take a look at the organic produce and see what the price difference is. Things like kale and lettuce and spinach, I may still get conventional, but I'm going to need tomatoes this weekend because I want to make some more salsa. And so, yeah, I might take a look at organic Roma tomatoes and see what the price difference is and, and give that a shot. It's definitely given me a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. I don't make large changes overnight, but this this may be a new habit for me. And I may see what other farmer's market options are available in the area. And I like your idea of researching the companies. I'd never thought about that before. Yeah, we see a lot of large brands in our food products. And if you look, there is often a lot of information either provided directly by the company or by their workers or advocacy organizations about how well or how poorly they are treating their farm workers and other people along their their processing like chain. Um, if you want more information on some of the foods that are really pesticide intensive, that's information that's really easily available. I think it's usually called like the the dirty something. I don't I don't remember. But it's gonna be things that are really easy for you yourself to eat raw, right? So it does not necessarily include things like potatoes or garlic, onions. Um, it will include most of your leafy greens, most of your really fresh vegetables. There's a lot of information out there. We couldn't fit it all into this four-part podcast, but yeah. I will say that your mom and I are trying an experiment where we're not going vegan or vegetarian, but we are buying mostly, if not exclusively, fruits and vegetables when we shop. Mm -hmm. And by extension, that means we're already spending less on food. So we do have a little room to spend extra on organic. So it, it might be worth trying. Yeah, I, I've, I'm very reticent um, about recommending relationships to food for other people because I think it's very personal. But for me, that's kind of my priority. Well, as your dad, I think it's a good priority to have. Thank you. You're welcome. If you have any questions about this series, any of our past episodes, this episode particularly, you can tweet at us or you can tweet with the hashtag ask one to grow on. And we'll be on Twitter answering questions. You can also email us at ask one to grow on pod at gmail.com. And we can field your questions that way too. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. This show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It is produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at One to Grow On Pod. You can find all of our episodes as well as more information about the show and the team on our website, one to grow on pod.com. Join our community and learn more about each episode at patreon.com slash one grow on pod. There you can get access to audio extras, fascinating follow-ups, and even custom art created just for you. If you like the show, please share it with your friends. Sharing is the best way to help us reach more ears. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody.